Breaking news, SpaceX enthusiasts. Starship's eighth flight is now just days away, with all systems go and paperwork falling into place. But that's not even the biggest headline this week. Flight 9 could make history as the first ever Starship catch attempt. SpaceX is racing to activate Starbase's second launch pad with those massive chopsticks that might soon snatch a returning Starship from the sky already moving on their own for the first time. The pace of innovation at Starbase is absolutely staggering. As we speak, Ship 34 and Booster 15 are being prepped in their respective mega bays, ready to roll out to the launch site. Meanwhile, official FCC documents have revealed something incredible. Flight 9 could see both the booster and the ship returning to the launch site. That's right, the orbital spacecraft itself might attempt a precision landing in those chopstick arms. This is a critical milestone on the path to full reusability, potentially accomplishing in just 10 flights what took Falcon 9 twice as long to achieve. The transformation of Starship from experimental prototype to fully operational system is happening right before our eyes. This is Elon Musk 24 hours with your Starbase update. Let's dive right in. Let's break down what we know about Starship's eighth flight. The paperwork trail has been intense this week with multiple regulatory filings pointing to a launch in the coming days. First, air traffic advisories appeared on Caribbean and Latin American aviation websites, initially showing February 26th as the primary target date. The launch window opens at 5.30 p.m. Central Time and runs for approximately one hour. But as we've just learned, Elon has confirmed on X that Flight 8 is now set for Friday, February 28th. These advisories give us a fascinating glimpse into SpaceX's evolving flight profile. Notably, the navigational hazard warnings for Flight 8 extend significantly farther east than those for Flight 7, all the way to Turks and Caicos. This extension isn't random, it's a direct response to where debris from Ship 33 ended up after that mid-flight explosion. SpaceX learns and adapts with remarkable speed. What remains unclear is whether SpaceX needs a new launch license modification before Flight 8 can proceed. We're also waiting for updates on the Flight 7 mishap investigation. These regulatory hurdles could potentially affect the timeline, but SpaceX has consistently surprised us with their ability to navigate bureaucracy. As for the vehicles themselves, both Ship 34 and Booster 15 remain inside their respective megabays. Ship 34 sits in Megabay 2, while Booster 15 occupies Megabay 1. The hot staging ring for Booster 15, the critical component that enables stage separation, has been moving between the Megabay and the Star Factory in an unusual pattern. We've seen it roll out to Megabay 1, only to return to the Star Factory days later. This back and forth has left even seasoned observers puzzled. Ship 34 presents its own mysteries, its position on the left side of Megabay 2, making it nearly impossible for observers to monitor changes or progress. With no road closures announced for vehicle transport to the pad, the readiness status for a February 28th launch remains questionable. But if there's one thing we've learned covering SpaceX, it's never to underestimate their capacity to compress timelines when needed. At the launch site itself, preparation continues at a relentless pace. The past two weeks have seen intensive testing of the chopsticks, those massive mechanical arms designed to catch returning boosters. We've witnessed SpaceX raising the chopsticks and cycling them through open close operations multiple times, simulating the precise movements needed for a successful booster catch. This testing confirms that Flight 8, like its predecessor since Flight 5, will likely involve a booster catch attempt at the launch site. But the real game changer emerged in SpaceX's FCC communications permit filing for Flight 9. In the seemingly mundane paperwork requesting approval to communicate with Starship and Super Heavy, one particular line stands out. The first stage booster and the second stage will either return to the launch site or perform a water landing. This is revolutionary. For the first time in official documentation, SpaceX has indicated that a ship, not just a booster, might return to Starbase for a catch attempt. The implications are enormous. While the filing doesn't guarantee a ship catch on Flight 9, it opens the door to this possibility with a water landing as the backup option. If successful, this would represent a quantum leap towards Starship's full reusability. Some observers have questioned the permit's language, 
particularly where it refers to a suborbital first stage booster and a second stage. This doesn't necessarily mean ship won't reach orbit. SpaceX's permit language has been imprecise before. The reality is that for a ship to return to Starbase, it would need to achieve at least a partial orbit before re-entry. Whether this means a single orbit or some novel trajectory remains to be seen. The hardware evidence supporting a potential ship catch is mounting. We've observed the delivery and installation of steel plates with square holes inside Mega Bay 2. These appear to be doubler plates designed to reinforce the area around ship catch pins, allowing them to bear the tremendous load of a landing ship. What's unclear is whether these reinforcements are being installed on Ship 35, intended for Flight 9, or Ship 36, as both vehicles are currently inside Mega Bay 2. Ship 36's nose cone and payload base sections have been spotted with what appear to be actual catch pins, unlike the decorative versions seen on Ship 33. The timing of various components being moved in and out of Mega Bay 2 suggests intense work on both ships, though the closed doors have made direct observation challenging. The sequence of events has been particularly intriguing. The first doubler plate was lifted, then Ship 36's forward dome section rolled into Mega Bay 2, followed hours later by the lifting of the second doubler plate. This compressed timeline suggests SpaceX might be prioritizing the catch pin installations for upcoming flights. When we consider that Starship may achieve full reusability by its 10th flight, the pace of SpaceX's progress becomes even more impressive. For comparison, Falcon 9 required 20 launches before successfully landing its booster. While these early Block 1 Starships will eventually be superseded by versions with integrated hot staging interfaces, proving out the catch and reuse capabilities now will accelerate the path to routine reusability for future iterations. Meanwhile, Ship 32's journey has come to an end. SpaceX has begun dismantling this veteran vehicle, cutting it into sections after rolling it into the high bay. Workers are methodically removing heat shield tiles from each barrel section before transferring the components to the Sanchez lot for eventual scrapping. This recycling process can take considerable time. Ship 26's nose cone, for instance, still remains in storage. Production continues at a breakneck pace with new components arriving weekly. Another ship aerodynamic flap was delivered recently, highlighting the distributed nature of SpaceX's manufacturing. Not all Starship hardware is built at Starbase. Raptor engines, for example, come from Hawthorne, California, and are tested at McGregor before arriving here. Some components are even manufactured by external vendors, while others might be transferred from different SpaceX facilities. This intersite transfer might soon include seven tanks recently removed from Launch Complex 39A in Florida. These tanks were previously located near the old hydrogen sphere at 39A, which SpaceX had converted for methane storage. Satellite imagery from Harry Stranger shows that not only the tanks, but also the subcoolers appear to have been removed. These components are now loaded on a barge departing Florida, and based on precedent, there's a good chance they're headed for Starbase. In a more aesthetic update, the mural on Starbase's multi-level parking garage is undergoing significant changes. Originally damaged some time ago, crews have been removing the artwork and painting the underlying surface white, whether this will remain a blank canvas or receive new artwork remains to be seen. A drone flight outside the restricted areas revealed continued construction at the Rio West project, west of Starbase. Initially planned as a shopping mall for visitors and residents, the SpaceX expansion may now be pivoting to employee housing. Strategically located just outside the blast danger area, these residences wouldn't require evacuation during launches, unlike homes in Boca Chica Village. The name Rio West requires little explanation. It's west of Starbase and near the Rio Grande. But the most dramatic construction activity continues at the launch site itself, where a second launch pad has been taking shape for nearly a year. Pad B features its own launch mount, tower, and set of chopstick arms. These new chopsticks were installed less than a month ago, and this week marked their first movement. This milestone wasn't achieved without challenges. SpaceX first had to install hydraulic actuators to enable the arms to open and close, then connect these to the hydraulic systems. The arms had been secured with straps during installation, which needed removal before testing could begin. Initially, only the left arm moved, but soon after, the right arm followed suit, 
The position they've taken relative to the tower mirrors that of Pad A's chopsticks when in resting configuration. Positioned on the tower's left side, where they'll receive ships and boosters for stacking. This positioning also provides clearance for ongoing work at the flame trench area. Elsewhere on Pad B, teams are busy with the cable chain, carrying wiring for the carriage system and chopstick arms. The tower's cable tray, extending from ground level to the ship quick disconnect arm level, is also receiving attention, with workers installing the numerous wires required to operate these systems. Valve actuators have appeared around the level where the ship quick disconnect arm will eventually be installed. These will regulate propellant flow between the tower and the ship. While the arm itself hasn't been installed yet, completing this preliminary work streamlines the overall construction timeline. Questions remain about the design of Pad B's booster quick disconnect umbilical. SpaceX appears to be constructing a gantry opposite the tower where this component might be located. All piping for the launch mount has terminated on this side of the flame trench, suggesting this is indeed the intended location. The exact configuration, whether one, two, or many umbilicals, remains unknown. Progress continues on both the launch mount and flame deflector at the Sanchez lot. While work on the mount has been less visibly dramatic recently, the flame deflector is now entering a new construction phase. Workers are aligning the pipes that form its structure using chain straps and a dedicated alignment jig, complete with cardboard boxes strapped on for cushioning. This massive water-cooled structure will eventually be transported down Highway 4 for installation at Pad B's flame trench. The tank farm expansion has accelerated with numerous subcoolers arriving this week in two sizes. One smaller subcooler appeared covered in what looks like insulation material. Additional stands for various tank farm components have also been delivered, demonstrating the extensive ground support infrastructure required. Even more tanks arrived this week from the Port of Brownsville staging area. Some have been positioned near the subcoolers and pumps for Pad B, while others have gone to what appears to be the future location of Pad B's Deluge Tank Farm. The sheer scale of construction activity confirms SpaceX's commitment to creating redundant launch capabilities at Starbase. With Flight 8 potentially just days away, we expect to see a temporary pause in Pad B construction as resources shift to flight preparations. This will include the rollout of Ship 34 and Booster 15 to the pad for stacking operations. The momentum at Starbase is building toward what could be the most ambitious phase yet in Starship's development. With Flight 8 targeting booster recovery and Flight 9 potentially attempting the first ever ship catch, we're witnessing the birth of the world's first fully reusable super heavy lift launch system. The implications for future space exploration are staggering potentially reducing launch costs by orders of magnitude and opening access to deep space in unprecedented ways. As we await Flight 8's launch, we're witnessing history unfold at Starbase. SpaceX is not just building rockets, they're reshaping our approach to space travel. From the rapid development of dual launch facilities to the groundbreaking potential of catching both boosters and ships, Starship represents the most ambitious leap in space technology since the Apollo program. What makes this particularly remarkable is the pace. While other aerospace projects might take decades to achieve incremental improvements, SpaceX is compressing this timeline dramatically. If Flight 9 successfully demonstrates a ship catch, Starship will have achieved full reusability in just 10 missions, a milestone that transforms the economics of space access forever. To stay updated on all these developments, make sure you're subscribed to Elon Musk 24 hours. Hit that notification bell so you don't miss our live coverage of Flight 8 and the build-up to Flight 9's historic catch attempt. If you found this information valuable, give this video a thumbs up. It helps more space enthusiasts discover our channel. Drop your predictions for Flight 8 in the comments below. Will we see a successful booster catch? How many engines do you think will remain operational during flight? Your insights make our community stronger. Until next time, Keep watching the skies and the chopsticks. This is Elon Musk 24 hours, bringing you tomorrow's space milestones today.